you know, when, when the stuff came out of Michael Berry, when it came about Ryder, it, it you know, it, it really hit hard. It really hits, hits deep. And, um, cause you'd really like to think that these guys are, are doing it with natural talent and hard work and, you know, that they're, they're upholding the true character for what we want our, our heroes to be. Welcome to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. I'm Matthew Piaro, and with me is Matt Hansen. How you doing, Matt? Real super. Thanks for asking. Yeah, that's great. That's good to hear. Today, we have a, a big interview. It's, it's in-depth. It's serious. But first, Matt, do you remember October 10th, 2012? Like it was yesterday. Really? What do you remember about that day? Uh, well, I went for a nice ride. It was an autumn day. Uh, there were some leaves. Uh, it was almost my birthday. And that was about it. Nothing else. Of note, I don't think. Nothing else. Ten years ago. Nothing else significant happened ten years ago. Oh, right. There was a bit of hullabaloo. Yes. I believe on the news about our sport. Yes. That was the day that USADA, the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, released its reasoned decision. It was a document with affidavits from riders such as Michael Berry, David Zabriskie, George Hincapie, Jonathan Vodders, many others with connections to Lance Armstrong and the U.S. Postal Team. This document supported USADA's earlier call to strip Armstrong of his Tour de France wins as well as other victories. It was a milestone, I would say, although a milestone is usually a a positive word, but it was a milestone in a particularly tumultuous time in road cycling. Does this sound familiar? Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember remember Oprah Winfrey, too. She made an appearance. Oh, that was a few months after. That was a few months after. Yeah, but this was all leading up to it. This was all leading up to that one night when you're sitting there going, what is going on? I mean, I'll never forget when Oprah interviews Lance, you know, whatever you said two months later. And I remember she came out right off the bat. Did you do drugs? She's like, yes. And you were like, huh, you finally said it. That's true. That's true. But uh, in this moment of the story, the occasion for this chat with uh, our guest, who I'll get into in a minute, is that day in October, which to see those affidavits and it's sort of similar to to that uh, moment on Oprah, but this was maybe a little less dramatic. But here you had all these documents with everything laid out in bare black and white, which was something to read at the time. For this episode and to go back in time 10 years ago, I spoke with former Cycling Canada President John Tolkamp. He's an interesting person in this saga because in a way he's an insider and also an outsider. There was stuff he kind of heard whispers about and he was very much active in trying to make sport clean in Canada. But yet he was also like many of us finding stuff out for sure, for sure, for the first time. So we are going to get in depth with John Tolkamp in just a moment. But before my conversation with John Tolkamp, Matt, how's cyclocross going for you? I'll tell you, it's just as awful as it was 20 years ago. Um, the difference is, of course, it's very difficult when you're fitter. When you're not as fit, it's actually even harder. <laughs> uh, but it's still fun to do it. I mean, it was, it was sort of surreal to jump on a cyclocross course again, but it was sort of fun to get out there. So you really haven't raced cross in 20 years? No, why would you? Well, I mean, I'm not just going to... It's a hard, hard thing to do. And, well, what's funny to me is I went to this midweek uh, cycle cross with Sam Cohen, the, the big boss at, at Rip Publishing. Uh, officially, he's called the publisher. Is that what it's called? I call him the big boss. Right. Um, mm-hmm. We have a different relationship, I guess. I And I remember riding around and it, there's a little chicanes and I just felt a little uh, not great through the chicanes. I'm like, what the hell am I doing? Why am I doing this? I don't want to do this. And so I start right at the back of the grid, thinking I'm just going to cruise behind everyone here. And after a couple of laps, I feel a little better. And I you know, start passing people. And of course, I pass the boss. And all I remember is him saying, there he goes. And I felt great. And then maybe 20 seconds later, I bit the dust. Of course. Right? Of course. Right after I, I sassed one of the guys up the road, I'm like, I'm coming for you. I hit the deck. Of course. Right. That's karma. And you had to, to, to lay your bike down, did you? 
yeah, yeah. I, I, I laid my bike and my knee and my elbow down just for <laughs> dramatic effect. But it's still fun. I mean, it's still a good little workout, and it's it's a cool course he's got underneath the lights. You know, that's also fun. I kind of felt like I needed reading glasses at one point, but yeah, that um, that course and that um, event put on by the the club midweek is I think that's gotten most cyclocrossers in the GTA started in cross for sure. I remember going there more than 10 years ago to uh, to learn about the muddy art of cross. And um, one thing for me, I haven't I haven't signed up for a race yet. I'm I'm still stealing myself for that. But uh, well, you're like that. Eh? You take a long time to commit. You don't just say I'm going to do this race. You think about it. You waffle, and then finally you pull the trigger. I'm analytical. Uh, I don't call it waffling. I call it mm. analysis. Also, there's this thing that for me, I know other riders have it, but for me, it's it only manifests itself with cyclocross. This pre-race dread. Um, it it starts sometimes before registration, but it definitely starts immediately after registration. You start questioning your decisions, mostly your fitness. Why am I doing this to myself? Mm-hmm. Yep. It's an interesting um, mind bender. Logically, you know everything's going to be fine, especially when you, like me, have finished last. You finished <laughs> who knows where in the pack. But um, ultimately, it's not that big of a deal, right? Right? No, it's fun. It's always still, no, it's, it feels nice afterwards. I mean, you sometimes will have a little banged up knee or sore back or whatever, but. Uh... You know, a victory is just a finish for us now, right? We finished the race, that's a victory. That's right. It's definitely type two fun because it's definitely better once it's over. Yep. Anyway, uh, watch this space. Maybe I'll report back having done a cross race. We'll see. Yeah, that's that's the sound of your enthusiasm. That's, oh, I'm just like, I'm trying to see what do I say? The suspense is just, I'm just so excited to see if you're going to just sign up or not. I mean, it's it's... It's better than the baseball playoffs right now. That's all I'm caring about. It's just, will he or won't he? Oh, oh, the baseball playoffs right now. We might have to cut this. They might be all over for your team. Um, they might be in the second round, too. Let's let's cut this. Let's. What are you doing right now? Stop talking about this. <laughs> Who's superstitious? It's, a, it's not superstition. It's just how sports works. Everyone knows that. <laughs> This is fact, not superstition. I'm a Toronto Maple Leaf fan, so trust me. All right. I know all about superstitions. Good luck with that. Let us return to our guest, who is John Tolkamp, former president of Cycling Canada. He was there for 10 years, and he was at the helm during a tumultuous time, which we are going to talk about. We're going to get into the lead up to that reasoned decision. We're going to look at what happened afterwards. So we are going to bring in Ryder Hesedal's story into the story, into our discussion. Remember, the uh, reason decision only had Michael Barry. He was the only Canadian officially named in it. What is interesting to me about John's story is that on one hand, he's privy to more information than your average bear, and then at the same time, he isn't. He makes a good point that Cycling Canada does not investigate uh, allegations of doping or suspicions of doping. It's a vehicle where riders can, um, you know, voice their concerns, but ultimately investigations come down to the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Sport here in Canada. But um, it is up to Cycling Canada to implement sometimes sanctions, and it's also trying to act, it's in its self-interest, it's in the sport's interest, to have clean sport and fairness in sport. So um, John does a good job of sort of giving us the lay of the land in terms of whose responsibility is what and what was happening. He has some interesting stories about riders like Michael Berry and Ryder Hesedal. And this is what I found interesting and their reactions and how they handled their um, their doping histories. It must have been a heck of a time for John. Those, those few weeks, or that whole fall, I guess. Must have been a busy time for him. It must have been overwhelming. I mean, I remember seeing Michael's face, and I, I guess it was probably CBC. He did his sort of initial apology. Maybe he did it in Radio Canada, but I remember it was uh, it was it was a, a very cycling busy uh, autumn. Maybe not in the best way, but there's a lot of cycling on the news. For sure, it's funny because I was new to this job. I had just started at 
Canadian Cycling Magazine. And in my previous uh, journalism career, I was not dealing with breaking news. So this was a little bit of a, what the heck have I gotten myself into? So it was, yeah, it was definitely a busy time. Like one of the biggest doping scandals of all time. Yeah. First day of the job, basically. <laughs> Pretty much. I remember going to lunch and coming back to the office. And I'm like, what did I miss in that hour? Like, please tell me n- it nothing hit the fan while I was just grabbing a burger, please. Anyway, we're going back in time uh, with the help of John Tolkamp. And it is a very fascinating listen. It's a deep dive. It's a long one. Please stick with us as we go back to 2012. John Tolkamp, you were the president of Cycling Canada from 2008 to 2018. Before that, you were on the board at Cycling Canada, which is this country's governing body for the sport. The focus of this talk is going to be the challenges you and the organization had to face with regard to doping, especially in the lead up to USADA's reasoned decision, which came out October 10th, 2012. That's 10 years ago now. We're going to get into what was happening behind the scenes in Canada before this important moment, and we're going to get into what happened afterward. But first, John, let's go way back. Tell us how you got into cycling. Well, thanks, uh, Matthew, for having me. And uh, yeah, uh, I don't think it's a short discussion of cycling, but cycling to me was, uh, you know, was, was uh, I started, you know, in elementary school. It was a way to get around. We lived in rural northern BC, Prince George. And uh, when I could and the weather was conducive, I would rather ride my bike than take the bus or walk to school. I think from uh, my earliest memories of competitive sport were kind of two things. I I somehow took notice of the uh, the cycling club in Prince George and the guys racing their fancy bikes and doing incredible distances and speeds and uh, and then as well I think you know Steve Bauer was one of my um, one of my mentors or you know heroes act actually back in the day and I can remember watching him race to a, a near gold at the LA Olympics and you know that distinctly I think that really you know twigged me when I was in my teens or actually probably early twenties that I was really interested in cycling and. Uh, had a bit of an opportunity in Prince George at 16 to do a race and then another time at 18, but it wasn't really till after graduate school that, uh, in, in, when I was in graduate school in Ottawa, that I started to actually, you know, take up cycling in a more structured format and Gord Fraser was coming off the track and was the, the hot young guy in Canada and I watched his career and, and a young guy that uh, just did phenomenally out of, out of Ottawa. Moved back to Prince George and uh, quickly got involved in the cycling club up there and uh, just did all the races and everything that was going on up there. And then uh, we had Gary and Lily and Schlesinger were actually the, the kind of the stalwarts. They were the organizing all the events and really making things happen. And Lillian was on the board of Cycling British Columbia. And at one point she was stepping down and she said, you know, you should, you should run for the board position here. And I, I said, I didn't know anything about governance, but uh, with her support, uh, I got elected to a, a board position at Cycling British Columbia. I think I was there for six or eight years i can't even remember and then cycling british columbia actually came to me with after some governance changes that were happening at cycling canada and said we'd love to put your name forward as a as a as a board member a uh, member at large for cycling canada and uh, yeah became a, a board member and uh was re-elected three times and uh, at that point in time there was term limits and i was supposed to step down but a few people uh in the organization and board members came to me and said we'd love you to stay on and uh you know, they uh, they said there's a real opportunity if you want to take on the president's position, which was uh, a bit daunting. Um, but I chatted with a few folks, and uh, the existing president at the time had decided to step aside to make that happen. So I came into the the president's position. Yeah, then ten more years of I would never have guessed ten more years as president of Cycling Canada, and uh, you know the places it's taken me. Got heavily involved with the UCI, partly to some of the discussions that we're going to have today around the doping situation and and everything that happened there. So it's been, yeah, been an interesting ride and uh, almost a second career for me. Well, on the idea of second career, the position of president at Cycling Canada is a volunteer one, if I'm not mistaken. It's not a quote unquote full-time job, but you had some big responsibilities. Did it, did it feel like a full-time job? Well, it never felt like a full-time job, but yeah, I think, you know, a lot of people think it is a full-time job and, and the board members, they think we're getting paid and no, it was volunteer. I mean, some of our expenses for travel are covered and things like that, but you know, it's, it, uh, to me, it was just, it really, it was really interesting to, to get involved with that. I mean, I was passionate about the sport. 
you know, and I think an interesting background in it, I didn't come from a professional background or anything like that, but came from a a background where, you know, where I just love the sport and wanted to see it grow. And, you know, I'd helped coach and I'd helped put on events that so brought, you know, key people into uh, into Prince George to help grow it and continue things going and got involved like that. And on a career perspective, actually, I started to learn that it really was helping me with my leadership development. And, uh, you know, I moved into very senior roles at very large organizations. And I actually would even write into my uh, performance plans, allow me to be the president, you know, allow me to give me the time and the space to do the work for Cycling Canada is, uh, you know, was one of my development opportunities. So it was, it was, it was uh, a great, fantastic opportunity and it helped me to grow as a person and uh, in career wise as well. Now, how prepared were you to face the world of doping in cycling? You know, it was, uh, I mean, early on, I'm glad I didn't have to deal with it right off the bat. One of my predecessors, uh, Bill Kanash, who was on the board for many, many years and, you know, was president at the time when the uh, Johnson incident happened at the Worlds in, in Hamilton. And he had to deal with that. And I mean, I, lo- I saw that as a board member and I thought, oh boy, I'm glad I'm not in issues right now because I wouldn't know how to deal with this. And, um, you know, it was just step by step. Um, in, early in my, you know, tenure as president, I actually told the board and, and, the, and the office, I said, I don't want anything to do with the international. I, I need to really understand the kind of the national body governing, you know, I have to understand, you know, on the podium, I had to understand the Canadian Olympic Committee, Sport Canada, all was going on, the other provinces. So I didn't really at all focus on the international meetings or the UCI and actually left that to the past president to deal with in the, in the first few years. So uh, and then later on, as it started to come, then I then I started to understand what was happening at you know at the international level and who some of the players were. And uh, you know there wasn't too much going on at the early part of uh, you know when I was president around doping. There were starting to be a lot of rumors, but you know uh, the culture then was kind of like cycling was like let's put our head down and let's try and ignore this and hopefully it'll go away. So it didn't kind of get you know in mainstream and it didn't really become front facing. But, uh, you know, I think we all sort of realized there was a, there was an issue in the sport. You're right. Like maybe it seemed a bit quiet. Like Festina was years ago. Um, I think you started, Lance hadn't come back yet. Armstrong had not come back. You were one year ahead of that. But uh, uh, one moment, at least for, for those of us in cycling, that was quite, uh, quite a milestone, I guess quite a specific date was, um, it was in April, 2010. Floyd Landis wrote a, an email to USA Cycling CEO Steve Johnson. This letter detailed some of the doping he had engaged in during his career. This is largely considered the moment when Landis really came clean after so much lying and dodging of the truth. In that letter, he names Canadian Michael Berry. Quote, While training for that Vuelta, I spent a good deal of time training with Matthew White and Michael Berry and shared the testosterone and EPO that we had and discussed the use thereof while training, end quote. That Vuelta, by the way, is the uh, 2003 Vuelta. What effect, if any, did that letter have here in Canada? You know, that letter was, I think, a culmination of what we started to suspect. Now, I mean, you know, in terms of individuals, I think back in those days, I'm trying to recall, for me, it was hard to believe that Michael Berry was involved. I really, you know, I really thought he was, you know, the poster boy of, uh, you know, a Canadian a Canadian kid that had talent and hard work and support of his parents, you know, had made, had reached the top. Never in my mind would I have thought that he was, he was involved in doping. And, um, you know, I think it just goes to a lot of us and myself very much included, I was very naive to the whole situation. And it wasn't until it was kind of smack put in front of me did I, I accept that this had been going on. I mean, even Armstrong, I was naive to for many, many years or, you know, and just loved the story and bought into it and everything like that. And, you know, you want your heroes, you want your heroes to be true heroes and clean heroes. And, you know, we loved what it was doing for the sport. And, you know, even though there's murmurs and things going on, you just think, well, we've got the stuff and we've got pl- things in place to catch that. And this just can't go on and on. But, you know, I think, I think for me, the whole process personally is it's, uh, I've learned to be less naive and a, a bit, you know, uh, you know, and I, and I hate that I've lost that, but I think, you know, we have to be, we have to sometimes suspect that these things are going to happen and that people are going to try and cheat. And, um, 
we got to keep our eyes open to it. I find that striking because I think that's a process so many of us have gone through from like, you know, having these heroes and then um, finding out more about them. And then you just you're a little more guarded in your uh, in the information you receive and how you process it. And, and unfortunately, maybe even sometimes your enthusiasm about uh, their achievements and stuff. Yeah, it certainly has tempered that. That it really, and and I hate to see that happen, right? And uh, when the stuff came out of Michael Berry, when it came about Ryder, it, it you know it, it really hit hard. It really hits hits deep, and because um, you'd really like to think that these guys are are doing it with natural talent and hard work, and you know that they're 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 upholding the true character for what we want our, our heroes to be. You know, thinking back to when Floyd came out. At that point, I was like, okay, this isn't beyond the, the realm of possibilities. And, you know, I'm starting to hear and what I'd heard of what was going on with Lance Armstrong and the U.S. Postal Team. Uh, at that point, I wasn't so naive. But to actually hear him named was a tough one. That was a really tough one. You know, and that, yeah, to me, you know, he was, uh, yeah, again, I, I always saw him as this, you know, quintessential Canadian boy, the great story coming out of, you know, the GTA, father owned the bike shop and, and everything. And when he got named, I was like, okay, this is, uh, this is tough. I'm going to have to reset what I think of some of, some of the people and how clean cycling is in Canada. Cause we'd always, you know, I always too, I think was naive about Canadians thinking that we, we were, I hate to say it, but better than some of the other countries in terms of how, you know, how we kept ourselves clean. And we, we operated, you know, with, uh, with openness and honesty, but uh, it, that really did change. And that was hard. Following Landis's letter, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's Jeff Nowitzki began an investigation into Lance Armstrong. Nowitzki's investigation was wide-ranging. He spoke with Armstrong sponsors, Trek and Nike. Um, in November 2010, he went to France to speak with officials in that country. Did Nowitzki have any contact with people involved with cycling in Canada, to your knowledge? There was a bit of contact, but it was mainly to get actually like, you know, kind of connect the dots of who's connected to who. That's that's as much as I recall. And he did, he might have chatted with our CEO at the time, Greg Mathieu, um, just to get some background information. You have to keep in, you have to remember that there was, you know, the organizations are, are very separate, right? We are not involved in, you know, assessing you know, doing doping investigations. That's, that's, that's the anti-doping bodies. So I would suspect that there was a lot more conversation going, well, actually I do know that there was a lot more conversation going on between CCES and the USAADA than, you know, USADA and Cycling Canada. So, you know, that's where the, that's where the level of detail conversations would go, like as what's been d- done there. And, um, cause we're not privy to this. It's all kept confidential. And, uh, We've got to keep, you know, keep these lines, you know, quite clear because, you know, for organizations like ours, the natural tendency would be to, uh, to, to try and protect our riders, right? And, uh, you know, so that's why you have the, the autonomy of CCS and USA, USA ADA. I'm glad you, you outlined that. And actually, I think we should step back before we get into this piece soup of acronyms. Uh, USADA, USADA, that's the US Anti-Doping Agency. And in Canada, we have... Canadian Center for Ethics in Sport, CCES. And yeah, those, that's an important distinction that you brought up, that there are these arm's length bodies, these bodies whose jobs it is to investigate these things. And, and Cycling Canada's job, while um, you support these activities, is different. Yeah, I mean, what actually ends up happening is if, a, you know, it would be this in Canada, with the Canadian Center for Ethics in Sport, CCES, who would come up with a ruling, find a doping violation, but it would be up to Cycling Canada to actually implement the, the um, you know, the penalties, where, you know, and take away licenses and everything like that. And maybe even take away, um, you know, winnings and, and championships and those types of things. We have to enact on their findings and penalize the riders and, and do what we can. But we don't actually do the investigation or anything like that. If we have suspicions, we would point CCS in that direction for sure. We would also, you know, let them know where we think would be a good time to be testing, give them guidance, what we think is our, you know, what would be good from that approach, what the strategies might be, but it's up to them to actually do it and, 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 and undergo it. On February 3rd, 2012, U.S. Attorney Andre Barat Jr. announced in a press release 
that the federal investigation into Armstrong, U.S. Postal, and doping allegations would stop. How did you feel about that announcement? I really was, I really didn't want these things to stop. I really thought we needed to throw everything we could at this to, to get to it, right? In my mind, yeah, we had, we had issues, we had problems. Within the sport, we were you know, ill-equipped to deal with it. And I thought these bodies could really, really help us and get to it. And very disappointed whenever, you know, things stopped and didn't go forward and you couldn't, couldn't get to the root of it. Because, you know, hey, two things, the, the rumors and everything just bubbled there and it continued to simmer and it was, a, it, was a, it was there. And the other thing was, we, you know, I felt we really need to try and clean the sport up. And uh, I, I was frustrated with the tools that we had, you know, at Cycling Canada, frustrated with the tools at CCES and, you know, the, and the government's work. And I was really hoping that, you know, the U.S. with their, with their you know, tools as well as the, the resources they had could get, get to this and, and help help us turn the corner. Just to, to speed the timeline along, I'm going to just mention that after the um, FDA's project was stopped, Travis Tigart at USADA took up the mantle, but he had to re-interview people. He couldn't just piggyback on the work that Nowitzki had done. And it was during this time that he spoke to many riders, including Michael Berry. And this was all confidential. Uh, you know, it stayed with either in the, the just the athletes themselves and probably um, certain people in management like Jonathan Vodders over at the Slipstream Project would have known. But um, this was going on. And yet 2012 was a great year for Canadian cycling. Uh, Ryder has it all won the Giro. And um, and also we had uh, Spider Tech powered by C10, Steve Bauer's Pro Continental Project that was doing quite well at the time. It was at the end of August that things started to get going. USADA said it would... Um, take away Armstrong's results. He'd be stripped of his seven Tour de France wins. That happened around on August 24th. So you have, on one hand, this great progress, especially in Canadian cycling, and then you have this reckoning coming. And and there's all kinds of signals that summer with um, Jonathan Vodders publishing an op-ed about doping or telling, uh, revealing his doping past in, I think it was the New York Times. Um, So how did you, as, say, not only someone president of Cycling Canada, but also a fan of the sport, how are you managing these two trains, if you will, that are chugging along and they're they're not exactly going in the right direction or same direction? No, you no, it's you've almost got to be bipolar sometimes (laughs) when you're dealing with it. It was it was tough. And especially in the role of, you know, the leadership, you know, the board and the senior management and myself at Cycling Canada, you know, we're fans of the sport. But at the same time, we we know there's a problem in the sport, right? And we don't know how far it goes. We don't know who's involved in. And it, it's a problem. And, you know, years earlier, I started to raise the flag and, and say things like, we're having troubles attracting kids into the sport because parents are thinking their kids are all going to end up being doped, right? And that's not what we wanted, right? And even though our athletes were doing really, really well, this, you know, this cheating culture was just hanging over the sport. And we had to deal with it. You just can't ignore it. And, you know, there was that whole Almerta, you know, the keeping quiet of the riders. But that was happening, you know, at the UCI. That was happening with national federations as well. Let's just keep quiet. Let's not talk about it, right? And it was very interesting. We, we had some really great conversations at the Cycling Canada Board with the, with the staff about how are we going to position ourselves in Canada around this? We, we made as a board and as a senior management, we said, you know what, where there's opportunities, we are going to try and push this and push for a clean sport. We've got to make some changes. We've got to change the culture. And, and we did. We were working in the background. We were trying to do the things that we could within our own, you know, in our own body. You know, we came up with a, the race clean program, you know, and tried to get some money behind it and tried to promote that. And what we really wanted to do was create a voice for the clean athletes to speak up, kind of change that narrative, right? Instead of clean athletes that were being chastised and being told not to speak about what was going on in the sport, we wanted to change that. We wanted to give those clean athletes the voice. We even had to fight with the, we even had to have a little battle with the UCI. We wanted to put the race cream logo on our national team jerseys at the world championships. And I can't remember if we actually were able to get that the first time or not, but eventually we got something that we could have on there because we just wanted to have this promotion. But at the same time, like you said, you know, we're, we're celebrating great victories and we're, you know, 
we're getting, you know, we're getting some great traction and some great visibility on Canadian talent and Canadian results. And so you're trying to, okay, this is good on one hand, this helps, but we've also got this challenge of the sport, but we needed to clean it up. Things were going to get, we're going to come crashing down. I'd rather have it cleaned up and then have a growing sport and growing results from our athletes. That, that to me was the way to go. That was the path forward. On October 10th, 2012, USADA released its reasoned decision a very large document with affidavits that brought things closer to home here in Canada. This reasoned decision contained an affidavit by Michael Berry. What was your October 2012 like for you with all this information coming out? Yeah, you know, it. I guess I think that's really when the cloak of naivety fell for myself. That was, you know, that was kind of like, wow, okay. If Michael's doped, then this goes a lot deeper than we thought, right? And, and you know, as in Cycling Canada too, uh, you know, it's like it, it, it continued to reinforce us what we, we, what we needed to do in terms of that cultural talk. I think, you know, that's, that's, that's where it came from. And um, a lot of focus started being, you know, put on, on what can we do to clean up the sport and doping, focusing on something that, you know, wasn't growing, the, you know, wasn't about growing the sport and getting athletes, you know, to the podium and things like that, which was, which sucked. But, you know, I think everybody realized we needed to do it, even though it wasn't our favorite thing. It was a, it was, you know, a tough, tough challenge, but we, we did need to start to focus on it. By the following year, Things seemed to calm down a bit, somewhat, on that front. But then another bomb was dropped on Canadian cycling on October 30th, 2013. In a Danish newspaper and in an autobiography that had come out, former pro Michael Rasmussen revealed that he had shown Ryder Hesedal, Seamus McGrath, and Chris Shepard how to use EPO in 2003. Did the way that information come out catch you and cycling canada by surprise as much as well i'll say as someone in the media it caught me completely off guard as well when that when that bombshell hit well i think you know officially there had been no news and we had no indication that there had been doping going on but unofficially you know we were hearing things right and lots of people were talking about it um and and we were like this is a tough part right you can't start to judge or be judge and jury without, you know, some facts in the organization. But, you know, before that, we'd started hearing enough noise and enough people were trying to connect dots and trying to show us how to connect dots. Um, you know, I had conversations with several different folks that knew these knew these people and, you know, we're trying to say, this is what's going on. What can you do? And everything like that. And, you know, I, I would, it, so it wasn't, I don't think as much of a surprise that that, that they were named at that point in time. Um, the way it came out was interesting for sure. Right. I, you know, that, that was, you know, it's like interesting to hear that, uh, you know, it looks like this Omerit is cracking. And again, you know, I think we had to jump on that and say, okay, yeah, the the tide is turning. And to me, that was a positive, right? It, it, it sucked that our Canadian athletes were being identified. It sucked that, you know, heroes were, were shown not to be heroes. Keep in mind, I knew, I knew Ryder from his, you know, I was in BC I'd heard about Ryder since he was 13, 14, and he actually came up to Prince George one time. We were doing a Wednesday race, and he came up and was racing, and 16-year-old, and I was just in awe of the talent of this guy and followed him. And to, and to hear that a guy that I'd watched grow up and hear so much about had succumbed to it was, again, you know, was really, really tough. It was really, really tough on a personal level. But, you know, I think given what happened the year before with Michael, um, wasn't quite as naive. But we have to, we had to balance, right? You know, we we you know we, we were doing what we could to educate folks. We were doing what we could to support investigations. Um, but you know, we couldn't condemn athletes vocally without any without any proof, right? And uh, so even after that came out, there's not much we could do other than there's someone speaking up about it. And you know, CCS, can you investigate this? USADA, can you investigate this? We need help. Mm-hmm. But the news itself, the way it came out, it came to us through Denmark. I guess that you weren't prepared for the story to be revealed in such a way on that day. 
No. And, and again, I think, you know, officially, like, that's all we could say. That's, you know, that's disappointing news if that's true, right? At the point in time, because we didn't know whether it was true or not. Ah, That's all you could really say, because it was just, it was, it was his former teammate saying it, coming out with it. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and it, it hadn't been conclusively, you know, and, and Ryder could deny it. Chris Shepard could deny it. All of that. Right. Yeah. But then later that day, Ryder's team, which was Garmin Sharp at the time, released a, a press release and it was... It wasn't totally informative, but it confirmed that Ryder, I think the phrase was down, went down a dark path. Right. Yeah. Again, I mean, it was no, you know, it was no conclusive anti-doping violation. Right. And we, we can't react to that. Right. Right. We have to react to a conclusive anti-doping violation. We can, I mean, in terms of officially reacting, like, a, you know, taking sanctions and everything like that. If, if there's rumors, yeah, we can, we react in certain manners by, you know, asking CCS to do some investigation, you know, those types of things. And, and again, that's where it's frustrating. Like there's, there's very little power for organizations like the CCS and us to investigate. You know, we can call people up and say, hey, do you want to talk about this? Can you tell us about this? We want you to, you want to, we want you to tell the truth, right? You know, and that's, that's about as much as you can do because you don't have the power of the law behind you for this type of thing. You know, and that's, you know, that's one of the things that I think that does need to change. You know, some countries like Italy and, and a few others, you know, if you, if you do have a doping violation, it's actually a criminal act. And so that's, that's you know, the real challenge and a frustrating thing. You can, we can see all the smoke, but, but we, we can't, you know, we don't have the tools there to actually uncover if there's a fire there or not. Interesting. I, and I think this leads into my next question, because that day, with all these statements coming out, Cycling Canada released one, and in one part it read, quote, The fact that athletes are not willing to speak out about their personal experiences with doping remains a serious stumbling block in this pursuit. As for the Canadian riders cited in today's allegations, if they have information they wish to share regarding their experiences in cycling and the issue of doping, it remains our hope, this is Cycling Canada, our hope that they will come forward should they have information that can assist in the light against doping, unquote. So I guess the reason I read all that is what is, are we trying to find out at this point? Because, or maybe this wasn't even clear at the, the moment that this letter was drafted because has it all, and a lot of people who spoke to you saw that had to spill the beans, or if they were found to be withholding anything, they would have like people like Barry and Zabriskie, they were given a six month, um, a suspension and some of them retired. So it kind of didn't matter, but like someone who's still in his career, Ryder has it all, like if he was withholding anything, he probably would have been banned for life. So um, is that plea for information from Bicycling Canada a result of USADA has its silo, CCS has its silo, and it's only when it's shared with you guys that you guys can actually move forward? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it wasn't us saying, you know, share that information with us. Please share it with like CCS or USADA if you have any information, right? I think we were aware that, you know, people were trying to avoid the discussion and we were trying to encourage all of our riders, if they had any information, whether it was, you know, linked to the U.S. Postal case or not, to please share, right? It was again, you know, like I was saying earlier, we wanted the athletes to have that voice to clean up the sport. Whether you're participated or not, please share what you know. Because, you know, all we hear is rumors and we don't see, you know, see specific things. And, um, Athletes don't want to talk about what's happening within their teams because, you know, that's where they're getting paid. They don't want to talk about their, their fellow riders because they're with their friends, those types of things. So it was really like comes back to we needed to change that narrative instead of being quiet about it. Get your voice. Speak up about this. You know, if you're clean and you want a clean sport, please, we need you to talk about it. How do you feel about how the UCI acted through all of this? Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I started to think, I mean, I started to feel that they were part of the problem in that they were just continuing this, um, you know, this, this culture of Amer- Amerta and uh, they just wanted to squash it. Like, let's get through this. I mean, obviously Lance, Lance Armstrong and, you know, and his wins and everything is a huge boon for the sport. And they didn't want to see that taken down, but they really just, you know, in my mind, they just wanted to sidestep it. And, um, you know, I, I ended up, you know, we came out of a board meeting and I'd been talking to parents and, and I didn't see the UCI doing what I thought were things necessarily to try and clean up the sport or to change the culture at all. So I, I wrote, uh, you know, I wrote the president at the time and I wrote the management committee uh, a letter. And I, I said, look, 
we've got to change this. This is crazy. I've got parents that don't want to put their kids into the sport. Got to change this. And, uh, you know, I spoke up in a letter and, um, and talked to Pat McQuay directly about it. I was really disappointed in kind of the response. It was more just placating response that I got. So this was after the letter and after a, a one-on-one conversation with Pat McQuaid, the president of the UCI? Yeah, yeah. It was very disappointing. And there's a few people that I, I felt I could phone up and talk to. It, you know, First of all, there's a language barrier with a lot of people and I only speak English. So you know, I did start calling up some of the uh, management committee, the English-speaking people and having conversations with them. And um, you know, one of them was Brian Cookson and, and he was president of GB Cycling. And he and I were very much on the same wavelength about it too. And he says, yeah, we got to do something about this. And, you know, and, and he was getting upset with how the UCI was dealing with it. And I do know, and I'd like to think that my conversation with Brian precipitated him putting his hat in the ring to run for president. Because one of the things he needed to change was that kind of culture. And that letter and that whole, that, that, that whole approach was actually, you know, was, was backed by uh, the board because we wanted to be a voice where we could and try and change things. So, you know, I wrote the letter, but I sent it off to the CEO and to the board and said, you know, this is what I'm, this is what I want to write. I'm not just doing this myself, you know, and everybody was behind it. And we sent off that letter. It actually (laughs) accidentally got leaked to the press, which I think in hindsight was probably a good thing, but uh, it wasn't meant to get to the press. It did get there by accident. It's one of the things that personally, I'm very proud of that we did to, you know, to kind of stick our heads up. And tell the governing body things needed to change. And I'm glad we as, you know, as Canadians and uh, Cycling Canada took that stance. And, and I think it did help move the bar quite significantly, actually, and move things along quicker than, than they did happen. Can you contrast the ways in which Michael Berry and Ryder Hesedal handled their own doping histories? You know, I'll take a step back here. You know, personally, I feel first of all, very sorry to these athletes that they were thrown into a culture where they had to make that decision, right? You know, it's a tough decision and I recognize they're young athletes and they get thrown into this and it seems like everybody else is doing it. So I feel like, you know, we in cycling are partly to blame for that. But at the same time, as president of Cycling Canada and as Cycling Canada, we had to take a hard line. We couldn't condone it and we had to speak out about it hard because we wanted to show to the up and coming kids and to the current athletes at the time that this wasn't going to be tolerated, right? And we needed them to speak up. So we had to speak up hard about it. So we would come out very publicly and say, this is unacceptable and everything like that and can come out hard. But at the same time, there's personal compassion for the folks that are thrown into it in the situations. And I, th- I can remember thinking too, when Michael Berry's came out, I was like, oh man, I wonder what Michael's first conversation with his mom and dad was like about this, because they, I don't believe they knew. And I'm pretty sure they didn't know. And that, that would have been tough and hard to have. And, you know, and then I was in Toronto one time and I just reached out to Michael. I said, hey, I'm in Toronto. How about we just have a coffee? You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to share into detail conversations, but I just said, hey, I just want you to know that, you know, again, on a personal level, I feel for you that you're thrown into this, you know, and they had to make a bad choice. But at the same time, there's a lot of other athletes who didn't make that choice. And, you know, they were robbed of opportunities and and we have to take a stance like this. And, you know, had a great conversation with him, I would say. I felt total remorse from him and, you know, trying to give him a perspective of where the organization was. And, you know, obviously there, he's trying to figure out, is there going to be a role for him in Canada and cycling going forward and everything like that. And, you know, our official line was, we can't have confirmed dopers involved in the sport in an official capacity. But if they want to, you know, do their own thing and everything like that, we're not going to stand in their way, right? But, you know, we're not going <laughs> to, we're not going to have you come and run the high performance committee or anything like that. Or, you know, we just can't have you as a coach or anything like that. We're going to give that to the athletes that have had clean paths, the ones that, you know, lost out on opportunities. We're going to focus on those folks. And, you know, try to convey that that message to him. And, you know, and it, was, it was a good conversation. I think it was, you know, probably not initially what he wanted to hear, but we were both willing to listen. and could see where we were coming from. And, uh, you know, and Ryder, on the other hand, was just really didn't want to talk about it. Never really wanted to have a conversation. I opened the door many times. And he really just wanted to say, that's in the past. I don't want to talk about it and move on, which, you know, I think is, is a tough way to, to live and not to actually come to terms with it and, and everything like that. And, you know, so very two different kind of approaches to it, where Michael was very open to having a conversation, you know, kind of accepted it 
And, um, you know, I think for Ryder, again, he was still in the midst of his career. He just wanted to move on and not have that discussion, not talk about it. What I find interesting about Ryder Hesedal's approach is, well, his good friend, David Miller, you know, had his own really rocky path through cycling uh, that involved doping. And David Miller is quite open about it. He doesn't shy away from his narrative, how he strayed, how he came back. And then, and I know they're, I know they're pretty close, those two. And then you have Ryder Hesedal, who just will not, now, I won't say will not talk about it, but he is very reticent to discuss it. Well, the very, you know, the, the interesting tidbit on that, or the story, my personal story was that I was actually at a, an event in Vancouver. David Miller was in town promoting his chapter three and uh, got invited to it in a Q&A and Ryder was there. So I had a, had a chance to chat with Ryder again. And I said, hey, if you ever want to have a one-on-one talk about this? He says, oh, no, I don't want to talk about this. You know, I really don't want to talk about this. And I'm like, well, I said, you know, I said, I feel for you and everything like that. But, you know, like, let's have a chat about where you're going and what's, what's going on and where, where Cycling Canada is at. He's like, no, no, I don't want to talk about this anymore. And then, uh, you know, and David Miller was actually standing right there and he's like, Ryder, you should just talk about this. Like, I keep telling Ryder, he should just like, like, just be fully open about it. That's the best thing, right? Type of thing, conversation it was. And then further, you know, into the evening, David did his, you know, David was doing a Q&A. And I think it was the third question, right from the floor. Somebody just says, talk about doping. And then Ryder, Ryder was beside me. He goes, see, why do people want to keep talking about this? Like, I can't, you know, we, we got to st- move on beyond this. And I said, I turned to Ryder and I just said to Ryder, I said, Ryder, this is why I want to talk about it because it keeps coming up and we got to have the honest, open conversations because if we don't, it just looks like we're trying to cover something up. He didn't, I don't recall him saying anything, but hopefully that simmered and hopefully down the path, uh, you know, for him, if, if he ever has a chance, I mean, I'm not saying come talk to me, but I think it could be very therapeutic to anybody that's been through all of that to, to be open about it and, and not continue to sidestep it for the rest of their life. In 2014, Cycling Canada and the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Sport came out with a national consultation on doping. And it, I think it was uh, ran for a few months and they encouraged anyone to speak anonymously about the subject. Do you remember that initiative? And was it a res- direct result? I'm guessing it was a direct result of what had gone on in 2012 and 2013. For sure, yeah. We continue wanted to provide avenues and channels for people to talk about this, right? And you get it that people don't want to talk to the governing body openly, right? So we were like, okay, you know, here's opportunities. We want to provide that opportunity to uncover more if there's more, because we really did want to understand where things were coming from. Was there people in the background that we'd never even thought about that are kind of facilitating getting drugs, get, you know, you know, everything like that. We really wanted to continue to uncover because, you know, we didn't want surprises keeping popping up, right? And and like I said, it goes to trying to continue to give athletes that voice around all of this. And, you know, what's interesting to me is I think the culture in sport is changing dramatically around athletes getting their voice. You see that in so many different, ad- I'm not just talking about doping, but, you know, about claims of abuse and what coaches have done and what organizations have done. While we're, you know, seeing what we're seeing happen in Hockey Canada right now, what's happened with, you know, uh, Soccer Canada, Gymnastics Canada, that's all tough stuff, but that's all what needs to be done to clean up, to change cultures. And the athletes are getting their voice and I love it. It's not easy for them, right? It's tough. They're young. They're in positions of lacking power, vulnerable, everything like that. And, and, and you know, I, I, I think... That's very, very healthy and is going to change how sport is viewed and how, how beneficial sport can be to young people in the future as well. The, uh, that consultation in 2014, the result of it, uh, or the takeaway that I remember, was there have been dopers in Canada, but there's no culture of doping. Was that a significant finding in your mind? I think, well... You know, I, I have to say that personally, I felt what came out of that was a little bit, you know, I was hoping there was going to be more meat that we could get out of that consultation process at the, at the point in time. But I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't like to f- feel that out of that, we kind of said, okay, we're okay, right? We don't have this culture of doping. But I think we did need to say that in some manners, 
you know, because, I mean, if it had gone the other way, right? Imagine it had gone the other way and we started to uncover that there was a systematic doping in different areas and everything like that. Wow, that would have been a really challenging and, you know, much more upheaval process to go through. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure we got all, you know, I think, you know, I don't think we're going to get everything and it's never, you know, and that not going to all come out, but it was, you know, it was, uh, it was as honest as an attempt as I thought we could do in the, org, you know, at the time to try and get some discussion and get more information out. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not naive today. I don't think we got everything out, but I think it, it helped, it helped play the process and it, you know, and, and, uh, you know, we wanted to walk the talk as well. And if we had a problem, we wanted to deal with it head on. What is the the biggest, maybe, or most important change that you've seen since 2012? Well, I, I go back to, you know, giving athletes their voice, whether it's speaking up about the doping or the abuse of a coach or an organization that's not playing fair, that the athletes feel that they can raise their voice now. They have some power in this, in this whole situation. And, and hopefully that they feel they're valued in all of it. What still needs to be done? Well, <laughs> there's, I mean, there's a lot there. It's frustrating and sad to me. I've, I've had conversations with several athletes around things where, there's, where they've kind of spoken to me about, and this is past my time as president, I've had some athletes reach out to me about things that they've seen, um, abuse or this or that. And, I, and I'm encouraging them to go, you know, and follow the proper channels, but they just don't want to do that yet. They don't feel comfortable doing that. And that's so hard and so sad to see that athletes don't want to do that. They don't want to get dragged down into a process or what they think is politics or get blacklisted. And that's tough. You know, I just want them to know that, you know, I, I want them to feel that it's more comfortable. And if they don't feel comfortable today, I don't necessarily look at them and say, that's because you don't, you, you aren't courageous enough. I look at it and go, what are we doing in sport that's systemically causing these folks to not want to raise these issues and have these tough conversations. That's what I was going to ask. It's like, well, what is it about them not wanting to go through the process? What do they either fear or is it fear? Is it mistrust? What is it? It's, well, it's, 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 it's all of that. Yeah. Fear, mistrust. They feel like they're going to get blacklisted. Um, you know, they feel that their, their name might get in the media or things like that. And they just don't want that. Um, you know, it's, and it's understandable because they're in a, a very public position or their name could be made public in a way in, in, in a way that they don't want or can't control. Well, it, it goes, you know, it, it goes to why, you know, you know, why do women don't, you know, go to the police about, uh, you know, being raped or an abuse or something like that. Right. It's just they, they, that is a very vulnerable position you put yourself into for different reasons. And so we've got to we've got to change that. We've got to. You know, and we've got to change the, the way that that works. Hopefully, we don't even get to it. Like, to me, that's the, that's the ultimate goal is to put in place organizations that are, you know, are strong to their core, right? You know, you've got the right behaviors, you've got the right cultures, you've got coaches that, you know, are above, above and beyond, you know, supportive of athletes and, and not taking advantage of them. Like, you know, so that's, yeah, that's, that's a tough thing. Well, John... Thank you for your time and and all your insights. I, I really appreciate um, I really appreciate them. So um, yeah, thanks again. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I I can't believe it's been ten years already since uh, since that reasoned decision. And uh, time flies, actually. It really does. And hopefully, hopefully the sport is is getting cleaner and continues to be cleaner. And you know, hopefully the Canadian athletes and especially our cyclists continue to do really really well and continue to medal and make us all proud. And that's the episode. It is written and edited by me. And I had help from Matt Hansen. Thank you, Matt. Oh, as always, just a pleasure to be here. Just a pleasure. I can hear the enthusiasm in your voice. Mm -hmm. That's real. It's authentic. Also, we had help from Terry McCall. This episode is produced by Adam Killick. And he did the music, too. Special thanks to Ontario Creates for its support. Matt, um, you're, I get the sense you're itching to get to that, uh, that Zwift race right now. You, um, it's, it's almost your lunchtime and, um. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm actually changing on camera. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Look away. Oh, blessed listeners. You're so lucky this is audio only. Um, well, good luck with uh, riding really fast on the spot. Mm-hmm. Going nowhere fast. I think I've got to dust off the trainer soon, too. It's, it's getting that time of year. Matt, good luck with your races. Listeners, thank you for tuning in. Ride safe, and we'll talk to you later. <laughs>